that's um, how this is going to be. I put like uh, this agenda, I shared this agenda with you before. Um, I'm going to try to go over like the three main aspects of what is called um, physiological computing, which is in a sense how to sense, how to collect data. The second one is how to analyze the data, how to make you know the raw data and to bring like insights for the feature that you can use to describe um, uh, specific um, human states. And the third one is more into okay, once we know those features are related to a specific human state, which is called engagement, boredom, or flow, what can we do with it? Which is at the end kind of like closing the loop, that means making adaptive systems. So a system that can respond reactively to it. We have built some uh, tools for it. Uh, they're very experimental, so don't expect miracles from the tools that we have. Um, I'm also going to be uh, bringing some MATLAB and Python tools uh, tomorrow. So if you can get your computers ready with uh, MATLAB, uh, the oldest version, the better. Because uh, a lot of the, the, the things that I've seen with the, new, the newest version of MATLAB, they're just changing a lot of things. So a lot of the previous work that I did during my PhD, they don't work in MATLAB 2021. So kind of user interface and others. And the same thing for uh, Python. Um, I just started recently using Python, so maybe you guys have more experience with it. But we have been doing a lot of the libraries that we have in the laboratory are made uh, or are, have been created in Python. So you can also use those two. Try to get them uh, Python and MATLAB ready for tomorrow so I can share uh, some of the scripts and you can download them and, and you know play a little bit. So for tomorrow, we will uh, go mostly through some definitions, categories, and applications. Uh, we will play uh, a bit with the sensors we have at the lab. So uh, we uh, have um, purchased some uh, months ago the Polar Chest Strap Sensor. You will see that this is, although it's, very, it's, it's quite simple, it's also very convenient for a lot of the research we do. Because this small thing, is, I think it's a, it's a Finnish company, they do a lot of the processing on board. So you don't need to go through a lot of the manual processing of ECG signals, electrocardiogram signals, which is what this is giving you. So it gives you already some useful things. And we will go with the shimmer devices, which are the sensors we have at the lab. So we have a lot. Um, uh, we're gonna, I mean, we're not gonna be able to cover many of the signals um, that uh, you're supposed to cover, like EEG, for instance, is like we will take me. You know, probably an entire course of electroencephalography or even electromyography. The ones that I've seen probably uh, we are here more interested to work uh, in our lab are IMUs, inertial measurement units, so movements and whole movements are related to the specific current. The yeah, ECG, specifically heart rate variability, and how those things can be related to you know, engagement or frustration. Uh, and the third one is electrodermal activity, which is arousal. So we will uh, go mostly through, you know, those three uh, quite briefly. So with this one, we will see IMUs and electrodermal activity, and we will play with the polar for the ECG and heart rate variability. We have installed some of the softwares. We have some licenses for work and also proprietary software. We will try to play with the software, and I will show you how the software works. Hi, Samira. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so for those that you, for those that don't know, um, Christina, or no, you can just go briefly introduce yeah. yourself. Yeah. Hi guys. Hi. So I'm Christina. I'm actually from the AHS building. Uh, we so I'm also in the same for my research, my research about mechanics. So I'm using um, quantifying the variables in the shoulder for oncological treatment, especially uh, radiotherapy. So I'm going to be using uh, shimmer devices to quantify the vibration motion of the shoulder and also to quantify the muscle activation of the, of the shoulder region as well. So this is perfect for me. I'm just, you know, it's like a, that bridge from, I'm, I'm from kinesiology, but it's like a, I, uh, it's like to, to build that bridge between engineer and kinesiology, so that's great. Across yeah. faculties, a lot of people they have these shimmer devices. It seems not a lot of people know who to work with it. And I perfectly, and I perfectly, <laughs> and I perfectly understand them. Is 
pretty expensive. The software is also a little bit expensive and a little bit spotty, as you will see. But it's what we have, and um, you know, it's not that bad. But just, just for the photo we just took up another sensor. What was the difference between the Yeah, we ones? have indeed two different polar devices. One is a chest strap sensor, so you need to actually strap it over here in the skin, and the other one is more a PPG, so autoplex tomography. It also records uh, blood saturation, uh, blood pressure. Uh, it's also related to cardiac activity, and you can also extract heart rate variability parameters that are you know similar to this one. So you more or less get towards the same type of analysis. Um, the, the tricky thing is this is an optical sensor, that means it varies a lot with the light conditions. This is an uh, electrophysiological sensor, that means it's, uh, it goes uh, con con by contacting the skin, it gets some um, electrical activity, and then the measurements are more accurate. And this is kind of like the old standard, but this is more comfortable because it's like in a smartwatch. Um, but you will see that um, um, if you want to get more towards more precise metrics, you will go through the uh, chest strap. Although it's not that comfortable for you know asking a participant to wear the chest strap. Um, we will get to there. Okay. Uh, so I have prepared some slides. Uh, I will share all the slides with you, and uh, I also have like some hyperlinks to the. Um, uh, readings. So again, the readings are optional. Like I mean, everything here is optional. Uh, but if you uh, manage to read the um, things before coming, you probably will understand better what I'm going to be talking again because you're not going to have a lot of time to go deep into each thing. This first reading is mostly about the field of physiological computing and you know what are kind of like the, the basic elements of uh, physiological computer system, which is more as what we're trying to cover in this three days. Collection, analysis, and translation. So the field is pretty uh, recent. It is mostly um, a lot of people from psychology joining with people in engineering and trying to define, okay, how can we uh, use all the knowledge that we have about biomedical sciences and um, um, join that to a more like human-computer interaction paradigms to build a kind of like a new field. So it is basically blending computers and human body signal analysis and you know, try to see what we can do in order to improve experiences. So it's used mostly in three applications, user research. So you want to know, you want to connect signals or sensors to people and you want to know what they are feeling or, or what is the type of reaction that they are having when you are exposing them to something. It can be a robot, can be you know, a game, can be a, a, an exercise activity. Second one is uh, called biofeedback. So a lot of uh, um, uh, clinicians, psychologists, were used in the 70s and the 80s, connecting sensors and just showing the, on the screen the signals, how they were varying. And based on specific self-regulation techniques, people will learn how to uh, self-control their own signals. So if you're you know, more or less stressed, your signals will be more agitated. So and then you just learn how to, you know, uh, have a relaxing breathing or how to decompress yourself. So you will be able to see the signals oscillating a little bit smoother and then you will kind of like control those signals. So that's why your feedback ex extensively used in clinical psychologists. Um, um, those uh, signals or the, a lot of the fundamentals that we talk here, they also apply to uh, clinical biofeedback. The third one is more like a, um, a more modern or more sophisticated application of physiological computing um, applications. It's called uh, intelligent adaptation. Somebody um, uh, coined the term bio cybernetic adaptation. Cybernetic because you know, it's related to computers and control systems, and bio because it's related to biosignals or biological applications. So the, the, the whole aspect is um, basically create closed loop systems based on the use of physiological signals. Uh, which physiological signals? So there's plenty of them. Indeed, the list is pretty extensive. Uh, we're going to be able to see EEG during now if somebody is interested in that. I also have some um, have done some work. I know Christopher, Professor Christopher, has also done some work on EEG. We don't have EEG uh, sensors in the lab. There's one or two other labs that they have EEG and they 
you know, we're trying to connect with them and, and, and try to make a... Alex, I'm recording in case you are... Yeah, I, I thought maybe the battery is not going to last this one, but I can connect it to the... I don't know. What I, I charged it uh, this morning, so yeah. it's four hours. So it's going to be enough for uh, today, but uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and, you know, the amount of signals, indeed, uh, let me show you here. I think this signal was coming. Yeah, this was coming uh, before. But this is a non extensive list of all the different physiological signals that you can find uh, in the literature and then, you know, all the kind of biometric data that you can find and all the small acronyms. So, as you can see, there's plenty of them. A lot of the signals that you can uh, um, try to use for recording and for connecting with humans. Um, and each of the signal is itself like an entire world. So there's people doing PhDs only on a specific element of ECG signals or on EFG signals and EDA signals. So what we will try to build in this workshop is more or less a knowledge of those three signals that I mentioned without going into you know, a lot of the details about um, those signals. So that's uh, physiological computing. And uh, what we try to do in physiological computing is basically to deconstruct uh, some of the activities that we have in the nervous system. So this is like a very simplistic um, hier hierarchy of or categories of the nervous system. So we basically have the central nervous system, which is mostly all the things that are related to brain and spinal cord. That's all the activity that we can sense from it. But we also have something that is called the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, we will have um, 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 some other divisions, like for instance, the motor, like things that are related to how um, our brain sends um, a specific inputs to the efferents, and then we can make specific movements, or to how we sense the information in the, in the world. When we go to this more uh, uh, motor, efferent, and neurons, we will also have a, a, a division or what is called the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. What in, you know, the, the main point of physiological, in physiological computing is basically try to differentiate be, between what is happening in the sympathetic nervous system versus what is happening in the parasympathetic nervous system. Those two nervous systems are basically quite opposite and they are uh, a way that they are uh, basically a way that our body is referring to the all in, the all the inputs that we are receiving. So when we are uh, sitting and digesting, when we are reacting to one specific stimulus, when we are feeling frustrated or when we are feeling engaged, there are certain activities and certain parts of our body that are reacting to those uh, uh, stimulus. And then what we try to do, or what the, the physiological computing field has been mostly focused, has been on how can we sense sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, I found a very like uh, interesting and very simple video or like describing the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. When he turns a corner and finds himself only feet away from a full-grown bear, mm -hmm. in a fraction of a second, the brain recognizes the animal in front of him as a bear and classifies it as a very big threat. Immediately, the sympathetic nervous system is activated, and without any conscious control by Phil at all, Several body functions are affected all at once. Number one, heart rate is increased. Increased heart rate results in an increase in oxygen and nutrients that reach the brain and muscles, preparing them to deal with whatever fill they have to face. Number two, the liver is stimulated to release glucose into the bloodstream, providing more energy that will be ready to power the muscles in case it is needed. Number three, the bronchioles in the lungs are dilated to allow more air into the lungs, which will increase oxygenation of the blood and keep up with the increased flow of blood through the lungs due to the increased heart rate. Number four, the pupils of the eyes are dilated. Because the sympathetic nervous system is often activated when people are surprised, pupil dilation is a visual cue that we use to read surprise on people's faces. Number five, the adrenal glands are stimulated to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine, 
The adrenal glands are a pair of hormone producing glands located on top of the kidneys that respond to stress. Together, the epinephrine and norepinephrine secreted by the adrenal glands have the same basic effects as the nerves of the sympathetic nervous system. By increasing so, sympathetic nervous system, to put it that simple, is fight and flight. So every time that something is coming, is repressing you, is uh, uh, making you feel agitated, making you feel a little bit stressed, those, when the sympathetic nervous system is, like, is reacting, and that's why a lot of these places in our body are actually changing their behavior. And that's what we normally uh, want to record when uh, we're exposing somebody to, uh, let's say, a robot or a specific it's experience. Heartache, increasing bronchial dilation, and increasing glucose release from the liver. In addition, norepinephrine is also known to increase alertness. It may seem redundant that these hormones have the same actions as a sympathetic neuron. Hormones have longer lasting effects than nerve impulses. So while the initial fight or flight response is mediated by neurons, these hormones serve to reinforce and help to sustain the response. Number six, digestive activity is inhibited. So what I was mentioning there is actually why there's a separation between the, the, um, uh, the peripheral nervous system, so this is a branch of the peripheral nervous system, and the central nervous system, because all of those things are happening even without us thinking that they will happen. So they, they happen just because it's a normal reaction of our body, and not because the brain is thinking, oh, yeah, there's a bird over there, oh, it seems aggressive, oh, we need to start, our heart rate needs to start bumping, or we need to start, like, uh, sweating more, or, you know, all those things are happening in an uh, uh, autonomic way. So, happening because they um, are a natural way that our body is responding to that specific situation that's happening. So it's, uh, kind of like can be inst instantiated or can be initially um, 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 modulated by some elements in the brain, but it's mostly uh, for all the parts of the body that are this certain. Moment of truth: a person may need every last ounce of energy they can muster. If Phil makes it through this ordeal, then he'll have plenty of time to complete digestion of whatever he ate for breakfast. Number seven: bladder is relaxed. After all. This isn't the time for a person to relieve themselves. There are more pressing matters at hand. Even so, I'll bet some of you out there are thinking, hold on, I thought that people wet themselves when they got scared. So it turns out that the sympathetic nervous system is only activated in situations where the brain decides that there is a reasonable chance of survival. In very extreme cases of danger, where the chances of survival seem remote, Crippling fear often takes over and people can lose bladder and bowel control. They may also go limp and play possum as last ditch efforts to survive. This is not a complete list of all the functions regulated by the sympathetic nervous system, but it does include most of the major functions that would come into play in Phil's situation with the bear. So for all of this, um, the different reactions of our body, there's at least one signal that can um, relate to that specific you know. So the heart rate monitors, we have uh, a lot of sensors that can be uh, uh, implanted inside of the body that will be able to record those specific signals. So what we are always looking in the field of uh, physiological computing is uh, better and novel ways to record those reactions in a way that is you know, minimal intrusive, in a way that is accurate, and in a way that we can interface that with a computer. We will see the uh, parasympathetic. As it turns out, Phil opted for flight over fight and ran away. He ran for almost a whole half mile before he dared to stop and turn around. But he could have easily run further if the need was there because his sympathetic nervous system had prepared him almost instantly to run for his life. When Phil turns around and sees that the bear is nowhere to be found, his parasympathetic nervous system begins the process of relaxing and calming the body so that it can recover from the heightened physical and metabolic activity. Some of the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system are, number one, heart rate is decreased. With the danger behind him, Phil no longer needs increased blood supply to his muscles, so the heart can slow down and conserve energy. Number two, the liver stops releasing glucose into the blood and instead focuses its activity on producing bile 
and detoxifying dangerous substances. Number three, the bronchioles in the lung are constricted to allow less air into the lungs. Now that heart rate is decreased and oxygen consumption in the muscles will be lower, the body doesn't need as much oxygen. Number four, the pupils of the eyes constrict back to a more normal size. Number five, the adrenal glands stop secreting epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now that the danger is past, it's time for the body to relax and recover, and these two hormones are counterproductive to resting and relaxation. Number six, digestive activity is stimulated. Phil survives his encounter with the bear, and his body can now continue digesting his breakfast. He'll need the energy to replace some of the reserves he used to run away from the bear. Number seven, the bladder contracts. Without an immediate threat around, Phil may now feel the need to relieve himself if he has a full bladder. Again, this is not a complete list of all the functions regulated by the parasympathetic nervous system, but it does include most of the major functions that would be affected in this situation. So that's mostly like the antagonist reaction, right? Uh, whereas sympathetic nervous system is more known for it has a, a fight and flight reaction, the parasympathetic nervous system will be more like rest and digest reactions. And those are like easy ways to kind of like remember those things. Every human state that you most of the time are trying to infer when doing the type of experiments we do, they somehow will have a little bit of both contributions. So they will have something about sympathetic, or something about getting excited, something about getting engaging with the activity, but at the same time we have something about, you know, at some point you cannot keep being excited or aroused for like a, a very extended period of time because we have been what, uh, you know, they were showing there. Uh, but then your body will start again trying to relax and, uh, or uh, debrief a little bit into the experience. This is the question, why some people end up in the, with a bed at the beginning they block, so I suppose some system that you have doesn't work properly or why this fight or flight at some point it, it, they block or some people block right yeah for, for the, yeah for for what for, for i've seen happens is like there are some uh, reactions of the body that are somehow expected under certain ranges so, so that means not. heart rate like you know if you when you're running you cannot expect your body to just keep like the 90 bpm or the 100 bpm or your body will start reacting a lot but when you go above certain maximums of those ranges just because you know sometimes part of your bodies are not that healthy mm -hmm. or you know sometimes it's big you know the, the the basic anatomical condition of the person so when you overreach those threshold values you know, that's where a lot of the, the bad things can happen. For instance, ox oxygen saturation uh, in your brain. Like when the, the, the blood that is running in the brain is not oxygenated enough because your lungs are not oxygenated enough, the blood or they don't have the capacity, then boom, just uh, uh, pass out. Mm. So, yeah, it's, um, it's hard to like dictate specifically why, but there are always a lot of like ranges on where you're supposed to be above or below the average of other specific situations on all specific signals. So, rest and digest, uh, uh, parasympathetic, fight and flight, sympathetic. Um, every time we talk about um, th this type of systems, we need to relate to signals and we need to relate on how to measure signals. Uh, how to measure those specific physiological phenomena. So in the scope of uh, biomedical signals, um, a biosignal or a physiological signal can be described as a, an, as, as a descriptor. So something that is describing a phenomenon that is happening. You saw all the phenomena that are happening with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. A signal is basically our way that engineers have to represent uh, those signals, so we need to quantify them, so we need to record them. So biosignals is basically a representation of those physiological phenomena. And uh, when you uh, go and see, like, there is plenty of biosignals, like the ones that I showed uh, um, last time, and there's many ways of categorizing those physiological signals. 
Um, I found this tree interesting. For instance, there is a simple way into you say, okay, biosignals that are, are uh, uh, categorized by their existence, for instance. They exist permanently or they are in use. So there are some signals that once you put the electrodes, then you will immediately record the signals. Whereas there are some other signals, like for instance, the electroplatism uh, you need to induce currents in order to uh, measure the response of um, that specific part of the body to the uh, 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 electricity or to that uh, stimulation. So a way to categorize is they exist based on this permanent or in this induced based on uh, the whole dynamic they are. So there are signals that are uh, quasi-static, uh, uh, like for instance, the body temperature. So the variation of the body temperature along the day, I mean, even when you are exposed to very extreme uh, 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 temperatures outside, so your body will keep regulating this. So it's not gonna vary a lot. So the, the, the way uh, that that signal is dynamically changing is very slow. Whereas you will have some of the signals that are going to be jumping all the day of like heart rate. So it's going to be varying a lot. Uh, the one that I found more uh, complete to categorize the uh, signals are based on the origin. So there are some signals on our body that are, um, you know, can be recorded based on electrical phenomena. So our body, our skin is always very much electrical. And then every time that we put uh, specific electrodes on any part of our body, there's things that we're going to be recording. So uh, there's some signals that are electrical, some of the signals are uh, magnetic, um, some of the signals are mechanic, like the ones that we will see for uh, the inertia measurement units, they're based on movement. So then we record that specific movement, uh, uh, signals that are optic, like the one that I just mentioned, uh, photoplatismography, signals that are acoustic, I don't know if you remember but back in the days. There's still some physicians do when the, you just go to there and they just put the and they try to hear the lungs and all those things. So that's you know a way of saying how is your body reacting, your lungs, your heart is reacting to it. And there are some other days on um, chemical components. So again, depending on what are you studying, there's gonna be a set, finite set of signals and sensors that you can use to better describe that physiological phenomenon. So again, uh, this is a non-extensive list, but uh, there's plenty of signals that you can always uh, explore. So the ones that we have selected for uh, this specific workshop well, I took this from uh, this guy So the one that we have selected for this workshop, but again, EDA, ECG, and inertial uh, measurement units. But before we go to the signals, and uh, before I actually show you uh, some of the software that we have for collecting those signals, um, you know, we, we are all here trying to um, make experiments in order to demonstrate a specific hypothesis that we have uh, in order to answer some research questions. Um, one of the main problems that I've seen when a lot of people are trying to get involved into using physiological signals is sometimes not giving a step back and kind of like getting to know the fundamentals on, you know, why are we using the signals. So, a lot of times what happens is um, um, uh, uh, there's a researcher that found sexy using the signals. So there's some budget, so they buy the sensors, and then without necessarily having a very clear research question, they just wire people with as many sensors as possible, um, hoping that they will be able to find uh, whatever human state they're looking at, because of course, like we have four or five modalities of signal somewhere there, uh, there should be a way of measuring um, frustration. Because well, why not? If there's literature, they're saying that. So I would say that's a classic mistake that uh, I've seen a lot. Um, uh, first, because um, when you connect many signals to a person uh, or many sensors to a person, uh, there's a 
are plenty of phenomena that are happening there that will make your signal, your individual signals, more noisy. So, for instance, there is a, a phenomenon called cross talking. So, electrodes that you put close to each other that will basically introduce noise. <laughs> To each other. So, you are, instead of measuring EMG, for instance, electrical activity of the muscles, plus uh, um, photoplexismography, so the photoplexismography sensor will be creating uh, some noise for the electrodes that are ordered that are electrophysiological. So, you will get noises in both signals. Uh, second one is um, because just by the fact of wiring the, 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 the individual or the subject with many sensors, that makes already the experience different. So that means, like, you know, the person is uncomfortable because you are wiring a lot of sensors, or the person is just feeling as a guinea pig at the lab because it, you have, like, so many sensors. So if you're trying to see, oh, how relaxed people would be when interacting with this robot, and then you block a bunch of sensors on them, like, you are already modifying the, what is supposed to be a pleasant experience by wearing on all those cables. Uh, there are many others, but uh, those are the two that I found more interesting. So I think the best way of uh, doing this type of experiences is basically coming back to the 60s and 70s. Uh, there was a specific field called psychophysiology. So psychologists trying to understand the uh, physiological reactions of people when they were pushed or exposed to a specific psychological states. Like we want to make this uh, experience with a very boring um, um, element, and then we want to see how people react to that uh, uh, boring element. So in a sense, is studying psychological states by using uh, physiological signals. Um, you know, in a very simple way. So imagine we are doing an, a classic experiment. In a classic experiment, we always want to try uh, to have what is called a control group. Control group is basically uh, a group that is not exposed to what we call the experimental uh, condition that we're having. For instance, we want to see how uh, effective a robot uh, can be to reduce uh, anxiety or reduce stress. And uh, then we want to compare that against a model for that. We want to compare that against uh, respiration techniques that you do at home by yourself. So, what you basically want to do is um, you get one or uh, multiple physiological descriptors. So you made your research, you say, okay, anxiety, what are the best descriptors for anxiety? So you found out that uh, respiration, you found out that heart rate ability, and that the electrical activity is a good descriptor. So you basically record that signal. You need to record that signal in both groups, in the control group and also in the experimental group. Um, it's very important normally when you do the control, uh, when you start this type of experiments, that you record what's called baselines. So, a baseline is basically the person without any type of exposition, without any type of um, uh, stimuli, how is the person feeling? How is that signal representing that person during resting? So, uh, most of the times, what I used to do is three to five minutes, uh, I ask the person to sit down get as comfortable as possible, get the electrodes connected, try to make the environment as quiet as possible, and then just ask the person to get relaxed and record those signals for three or five minutes. So, resting. Um, sometimes when people are um, using specific equipment, for instance, VR headset, you don't want to record the resting state while the person is just sit down, relax without the rest of the equipment. So you really want to see what is the effect of people having only the headset and then uh, uh, going through all the experiences would be the second part of the experience. So you connect everything but you don't put uh, uh, anything on the screen or you just have the person uh, uh, close to the robot for instance and then you just record what is the, what are the physiological signals related to that. So that would be the baseline. So you do that for both groups. When you move to the part in which you want to uh, um, uh, analyze what are the um, effects of people when they are being exposed to something, both the control group and the other, what you want to find out in psychophysiology is what we call the response. So it's basically the difference between what people are experiencing uh, in um, the, the comparison or the experimental group uh, when they were in baseline 
versus when they were exposed to the robot or when they were exposed to the specific condition that you were looking. That's all the response. And that's basically what we are trying to look. All the statistical analysis that you will do is not among is not among this one and this one, it's not among uh, this one and this one. It's mostly between what people were feeling during resting versus what people were feeling um, uh, uh, after the motion elicitation. So I have a question about the, the group. So you have two groups of people, right? So you have to, to compare them. So which are the, the, the factors you should, I mean, I know I usually have to have a similar sample. So similar gender, similar age, because I suppose what, what are the factors that could, could change quite a lot of physiological sense uh, signal? So age, uh, gender, even caffeine, stuff like this. Uh, what, what are the things that we have to take into account mm -hmm. when we design the two samples? Yeah. Um, well, there are two things that are called uh, intersubject and intrasubject variability. So, intrasubject variability means the variation of physiological responses of different people. So, uh, that's as you were saying, that's very different when it comes to ages, when it comes to gender, when it comes even to um, um, uh, yeah, the, the BMI, the amount of exercise they do, the sure. diet. So for the type of experiments we do, we're, you know, we're not in applied sciences, we're an engineer. So what we try to more or less control or, bal or balance is some, uh, some things related to the demographics. So, you know, a sample size where you have ages that are not super different, you try to balance gender because it's always like a lot of difference. A lot of the friends that I had that were using EEG, they were actually only doing experiments with males because of the hair. You know, because you put a lot of electrodes and then, you know, more, more hair you have, less, uh, more tricky will be processing the signals. But that's a very specific case for EEG. So what you also try to control are uh, um, cardiovascular um, activity or, for instance, if you are recording, a lot of the, the things that we try always to record, are, they are affected by the heart activity and the heart. So you try to, for instance, when you're working with older adults, you try to see that the older adults, they don't have uh, bypass or they don't have controllers or modulators to the heart rate acti activity. Mm. Uh, and then when you're doing an experiment, you, you try to be consistent with the time so if you do uh, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., you will ask people to even have the regular kind of like behavior or avoid things like coffee or avoid things like working hard last night. Because if you don't have a good sleep quality, then that will affect totally uh, the physiological signals. Last thing that sometimes seems to be a little bit uh, 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 superficial that I also like to control is uh, when I think we have here a, a thermal a thermometer, so you can measure humidity and temperature. Some physiological signals can vary even when you change one to uh, uh, degrees in temperature, and that only due of that change, and not because the emotional elicitation you're looking at. After atmosphere or the person? Uh, the atmosphere. The atmosphere. Yeah, the atmosphere. I suppose like so. So yeah, just. You know, we have, I think we have it over here at the beginning of the experiment, just write down what was the uh, temperature and humidity, and at the end of the experiment, just write down what was the temperature and humidity. Steven? Ah, uh, no, it was that good. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, just try to control those, that would be intra. Intersubject, uh, uh, intersubject variability is a little bit more complicated because the same person, when you record signals of the same person this morning and then you come, uh, she, come, she comes back in the afternoon and I record the same signal, then you can have a lot of different signals, even if, if, the, if the experiment was the same. So that's a little bit more complicated to, to balance, to counterbalance. So try to do it um, uh, a specific time in the morning and try to keep the person, when it's a long-term study, try to keep the person more or less, or, or you try to be informed what, the, what are the changes that the person is doing, diet exercise and uh, smoking, sleep quality. So you cannot control those, but at least you can kind of like have a, a, a logbook of what people were doing. So some of the changes that you were actually recording, you can associate those to those behavioral changes. But those, that's, those are more for long-term studies. So for the type of research we do here at the lab, that's you know, not, not always the case. So, uh, uh, kind of like basic on what are we trying to do in, in terms of psychophysiology. So, describe psychological states 
based on physiological descriptors. Um, theoretically, that sounds uh, pretty simple and straightforward, unfortunately. Uh, there's something that is called the psychophysiological relationships, which means that uh, when uh, somebody is stressed, there's not only one part of the body that will react to it. As we saw with the, with the, with the very example, there's plenty of uh, parts of our body that are reacting. So and that's why, uh, uh, um, as a researcher, we want to somehow do an initial mapping on how, on how the psychological states are related to physiological signals. So uh, this is a, a very interesting book. It's called The Handbook of Psychophysiology, by John Cassiopo, and he was mentioning these uh, 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 five uh, relationships. So the first relationship is a null relationship. Um, I think this is very hypothetical, but it's basically uh, psychological states that are not associated to any physiological signal. So even in the book, he was not able to make that example, but uh, you know that's that's part of the of, of the uh, relationship. So there's no relationship between one or the other. Maybe very specific psychological states. This is mm, this is a little bit hard to find, but still there's one. So imagine there is one specific psychological state that is associated to one and only one physiological signal. So sometimes arousal and electrodermal activity are like that. So when you are aroused, there is almost a direct increase in the uh, skin conductance level, and then you can associate more or less one to one. Um, but again, this is uh, this rate happens in uh, our daily life activities. What you will see a lot in the literature is basically this two. So you will have one too many, for instance. Uh, let's call uh, uh, let's get anxiety. So how many physiological descriptors you think anxiety has a psychological state in have? So anxiety can produce uh, 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 or, you know, can make you uh, sweat. Uh, anxiety can make you, your heart rate decrease or increase. Your heart rate can change the way that the frontal electrical activity is, uh, you know, being produced as response to specific emotional situation. So, one specific psychological state can be um, uh, described with so many physiological factors. And the same thing happens in the other way around. So. Uh, one single uh, uh, physiological signal can be used to describe many psychological states, heart rate variability. So when you take the variation of heart rate in time and frequency, then you can say, okay, that can be a descriptor of cardiovascular performance. That can be a descriptor of stress, psychological stress. That can be a descriptor of engagement and frustration. So you can use that for uh, many, many ones. And the many to many, which is a uh, you know, just a, an extension of the others. These are some of the questions that, you know, after having these psych, uh, psychophysiological relationships, so, you know, you, it's good for you to wonder, to ask yourself these questions before starting this study, for instance. You know, what do we select the, the appropriate variables for the study? So, before answering the, the appropriate uh, variables, you need to see, okay, what is the phenomenon, the human state that you are trying to study? So, is that anxiety, is that stress, is that, like, you know, put it on uh, names. All details should be the measurement, um, should be the measurement of the selected variables. So, how granular, the variable that you are extracting should be in order to describe that psychological state. Um, well, we're talking about situational. So, when we do control, uh, experiments versus in the field experiments. So context is, you know, an extra variable that you need to consider. So when you are asking people to come to this control environment, there's, there's a specific context where people will have specific physiological reactions. But when you are in the hospital, when you're in a long-term care facility, you need to consider the things that are happening there and how they might affect the physiological signal that you are studying. For instance, when we talk about temperature humidity, uh, for instance, when we talk about um, the presence of other people around or other distractors around. So context is normally um, a hard to a hard thing to consider. And how to effectively use uh, physiological measures to describe psychological factors. Just at the end of the workshop, 
um, we create a like small design framework. So we, you know, when you're trying to involve this type of metrics, so this is like some important questions that probably you need to consider before moving there. So we will see that at the end of this. Okay, almost one hour. Mm -hmm. We will move to the sequence. So as I mentioned before, uh, there's no time for um, going through you know, so many of the signals, so I made a selection of this tree. We will start with the electrodermal activity. Uh, I know some of you are trying to work with this one or also e um, the ECG and heart rate variability. Um, I mean, what sometimes is recommended is use, uh, not only using one signal, but more than one signal, but don't, don't go crazy. So a lot of the times, uh, uh, this psychological state that, that we were describing are actually well described in terms of two signals. So two is actually a good, a good number. So eye tracking plus uh, EDA is very good for engagement or arousal. So anxiety, if you use heart rate variability and electrodermal activity, there's like, you know, plenty of good um, literature there pointing out of this, uh, this combination. Why? Because um, Sometimes one signal is very good to describe one uh, um, psychological state, whereas the other one is good to describe in another one. So when you see increases in one of the signals and decreases in the other, so those are like two things that can be pointed out to the same psychological state that you are. Whereas if you have only one, only the decreases of this can be also associated to, uh, for instance, when you uh, are still down, you have ECG, just when you stand up, then you hard it close up. And that's not that it's nothing to, to do with the person feeling more excited because the role appear. No, it's just the person who stand up and then the body physiology will change. But if you combine that with arousal, you will say, okay, the moment or with, or with IMUs, you will say, okay, that was the moment when the person was standing. So if I observe heart rate, it's not because that was the same moment when the rubble was appearing, but it's just because the person was standing. So you combine those both sources. So you can use this uh, in combination. Indeed, uh, one of the good things of using this type of uh, physiological kits is that you can synchronize the physiological uh, signal recording. That means you can put the same time stamp. And that's something that we will see that is crucial when it comes to doing this type, this type of analysis of know, knowing exactly when you record. So for the ones that are not really familiar with the signal, this is uh, basically a way of, I, I like to see this, uh, uh, like imagine you have a bottle and um, the bottle normally is uh, the level of the water or the conductance is low. So when, when you are sweating, that bottle gets filled and that increases the level of conductance of your skin. And that's mostly what we're trying to record in electrodermal activity. So we call it electrodermal activity because that's the phenomenon that we are studying. A lot of people call it galvanic skin response. But we will see that's a very specific branch of those metrics that we will try to see. It is, uh, in a sense, um, the ability of the skin to conduct electricity. So. We will always be talking about the signals related to if they are or not associated to sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. So electrodermal activity is well known to uh, be a good descriptor of the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So five and five responses. So why? Because there are some specific uh, glands that are uh, producing uh, moisture when uh, the sympathetic nervous system is acting, and that's the thing that is basically filling out the glands with sweat, and uh, that's why we increase or or the level of skin conductance increase when we have that. GS, GSR and EDR is the same thing. Uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they also call electrodermal response. Uh, there's some others um, that are related to, to this skin conductance level or skin conductance response or you know those things are very similar um, uh, terms. So very simple way to see this is we got the balance. So you're chill, relaxed, no bear around. But then when the bird was um, kind of like appearing, then you saw all the things that were happening there. So a lot of the heart rate increases, the pupil 
dilating, uh, dilatation, and um, so the sympathetic nervous system is acting. When that is acting, you will see a specific increase on the skin conductance level, for instance, or you will see a uh, galvanic skin response. But then, after like you know the bird uh, uh, disappear and everything, so you're trying to still chill, relax. So you will see the um, uh, the heart rate increasing. So the parasympathetic nervous system will react. So the levels of skin conductance level will reduce. So again, very like simple. So that happens with activation, deactivation, acceleration, deacceleration, or when you tense or when you relax. So those are different phases of the sympathetic nervous system fight or flight or parasympathetic nervous system um, uh, rest and digest responses. Um, so um, action and activity is good for arousal or uh, what's called autonomic activation. So uh, engagement has a part of autonomic activation, frustration has a part of autonomic activation, anxiety, depression, all of them, they have multiple components of sympathetic and parasympathetic. So before going towards the, the patterns, I uh, would like to wear, uh, to wire somebody with the electronic activity sensor and to just show you how it works. So shimmer devices, the lab. So this is the delay of, of so when when I bend this ticket, right? So you see the bear. How much time does it take for you to measure that? What is the delay? Yeah, it's actually um okay, quite relevant relevant question because a lot of the times you will see that um when it comes to work with physiological signals, and we were describing about the. Um, uh, can you come back to Yes, you have one? I think we have one here. So, when it comes to working with the signals, the, the synchronization of the signals. And the events are happening in, the exper in your experiment is actually a crucial step because you want to be able to assign a specific physiological response to the experience that you were creating. So the robot was appearing, or you were switching the robot from a behavior A to a behavior B. How do you know the physiological reaction you had was actually because of the robot and not because of all the factors? So what Alex was mentioning is basically this scenario. So you have this is um, uh, uh, the, the EDA, it's sort of like that. This is normally micro Siemens. So uh, you measure conductivity. So you got uh, your EDA. You know, you got your advanced skin response, another one. So that's more or less how you might look. Say five minutes. So you got this, this is your experiment, this is the data of your experiment, boom, you just plot it and it looks like that. If you have the information that uh, Alex is actually requesting, that means uh, the markers, the markers will be okay. Right in this moment, I bring the roll. this is event A. Right in this moment, I did something else, I changed the behavior. I, you know, did something. So you, you bring all the markers related to the activities that you were doing. So if you don't have that information, then how would you say this, this is called a galvanic skin response, is associated to what you were uh, bringing to the, to the event. So if you make, a, a, you zoom in this, this would be more or less like this. So, the window, Alex, is four seconds. Four seconds, so much. Four seconds for EDA. So, if your stimuli, if your stimulus, stimuli is happening four seconds before the, the peak detection of the ESR, then you can say, okay, that specific response is associated to the, 
uh, uh, the symbol that I, uh, I was uh, presenting to the participant. And that, that changes depending on the signals. So for heart rate, so a heart rate increase can happen in 20 seconds or 30 seconds. So if you don't have that information at what, at what time, or you just um, uh, uh, bring a lot of uh, stimulation in, in short periods of time, and you are using something that heart rate, that's, you know, at the end, you're not going to be able to identify uh, if those changes of heart rate were because of A, B, or C. And that's always tricky because um, uh, you will think, like, when you are on a specific psychological state, for example, when you are scared, you think you, your heart rate will always bump, or will always go and increase. But I remember I was uh, reading in, in uh, book, uh, one, an example when you are, imagine you are in a cemetery, like dark night, nobody's there, you are just walking. Suddenly, you just, um, you just hear noise. So what happened in that moment? So what you will try to do is to basically calm your body down. You are super scared, but you are trying to calm your body as down as possible because you don't want your heart rate to be bumping a lot because then you are not going to be able to hear what is happening to the noise. So even though you are super scared, your heart rate is decreasing. So context, you know, is everything, or that's why you need to uh, uh, consider context when it uh, comes to all those signals. Does it change for the people, those four seconds? So does it change? That's or, like a... Or, yeah, that's kind of something that has been established. Okay. But if you see for uh, each uh, individual uh, example, like you will see probably differences. Context is basically the context, but that's one that you can use among us when you are trying to use uh, treat that. So the shimmer devices are mostly like small units. So you will be able to see for the ones that are probably not very familiar with it. So we got two types of. Uh, 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 shimmer devices. There's one that is basically a small IMU, and you will see over here it says IMU, and the other word is it says EXG. So most of them, uh, uh, the, the, you can use them um, uh, as an EMG sensor, as an ECG sensor, or as an, uh, another type of sensor. There's also some specific sensors for the GSR, so you will see IMU or GSR. The IMUs we have a lot. I, the 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 why do we have a lot is because this is very much used in biomechanics, and what we want to do is basically to uh, check the dynamics of the body when it's a movement. So you need several points. So you basically connect several into it. Uh, for the other electrophysiological signals, we don't have. We have a three or four, but mostly because we only want one per participant or over um, two maximum per participant. So, uh, once you have um, identified the type of signal that you want, then you connect the cable. Most of the cables, they have a ground. Um, uh, and they're called, um, some of them are called uh, differential uh, sensors. So that means that you, need, you record the signal on two individual sides and the type of signal that you're getting is the difference between those two. So that's called differential sensors. Uh, some of them are actually coming together, so this is EDA plus um, uh, PPG. I'm just going to remove the PPG because I'm not going to use it. So always try to be careful when connecting or disconnecting because the cables are quite uh, sensitive. So we will see um, EDA. So in EDA, remember when we want to record is uh, the uh, activities of the sweat glands, in this case conductance, and uh, we have many places in where we can record this. So we normally record them using the, ph the phalanges of the fingers, but those can be also recorded um, over here, electronic activity can be also recorded here, and armpits, and um, uh, I think uh, uh, there's a specific part of the foot as well where you can record them. So this is like an entire map when you can record those, but the most popular is on uh, fingers and thumbs. Uh, uh, Trevor, can you uh, give me a hand uh, connecting her to the sensors while I uh, switch to this? This is Trevor, you know him already, he has been uh, helping us a lot with the shimmer devices. 
I'm gonna switch so you will be able to see the, um, the signals and I'm gonna show you something that is very interesting from the signal. So this, these models, um, so these models are like USB models where um, you basically can configure the sensors to make more like field studies or to record signals in the field, so not in, in the lab. So you basically set up the sensors and then you take them off and then you can record the signal when they're happening and then you come back and you download the data. Uh, when you're using a single uh, sensor like this one, you will use probably the Bluetooth um, uh, option that the sensors have. So in this case, we will use the... Um, we have um, a software license for this, it's called Consensus Pro. It's similar to a lot of the, the softwares that I've seen from the hardware devices um, that I've uh, experienced before. So they basically have uh, panels for you to manage the devices. So you can see where are the devices, is there connected or not, and how do you record those. And uh, then they also will have real-time visualization of the data and uh, how to export the data into convenient formats. So um, that's how it is. So, uh, I'm not going to go over like a lot of the details of how to use this, the, 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 the software uh, because there's an entire manual for this and you know but we will do a simple recording but I will show you something that I found interesting from the, uh, this type of devices so since they are connected in Bluetooth so if you observe they all have like specific codes like there is a, a specific serial there so those are the ones that you need to search when uh, looking for the Bluetooth. So that's, I think that one is connected. And what is the number of that one? Do you remember? I think it's the 22. Uh, yeah, 022. Okay. Okay, it's the 22. So um, when you go through the Bluetooth, so you actually don't need to make a specific setup. Well, we did it already uh, for this sensor, uh, but here you will see a list of, this, of the shimmer units that have been used here before. So when you're using Bluetooth, you just um, uh, uh, come here and click and you see, uh, first you see that the sensor is uh, actually connected uh, through Bluetooth, and then you will be able to uh, mark what are the signals that you want to see. So remember, uh, that a lot of these electrophysiological uh, sensors they are recording one variable, but the one that you actually would like to see is different one. So, for instance, you will be collecting the resistance, but then you have a four. Okay, so let's take a look. So you select the ones that you want. Let's see here, all of this, and then you play. So, you will be probably seeing some of the, the variables uh, that we want to see, but the orange value is the one that we want to record. So remember, um, this is a, me um, a measurement of the sympathetic nervous system. So that means that, um, you know, a specific uh, fire and fire responses that she will have will be described by uh, increases or decreases of the what is called the skin conductance level so this is the skin conductance level when you have a specific reaction you will see a peak that's called the galvanic skin response so uh, how do you know the sensor is actually recording properly so each signal has kind of like its own trick to see so for the anus it's kind of like simple so you just move and then you see the variations for the ECG, like you can see the PQRST complex, and then you will be able to identify the peaks. For the EDA, you blow. So just stay there, connect, and then blow. No, no, with that one. Just yeah, just put the hands there and blow. No, like stronger. 
So you will see um, a specific reaction of the galvanic skin response. So Jill, you see now she is in the yeah. fo focus of the attention. So let's do it again, but slower. So you see basically some changes when she is doing that. So uh, that's like a quick way of saying that at least the EDA uh, signal is uh, 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 working. So you see now that she's more. She's not she kind of like. She, she was doing that. <laughs> huh? doing no. So. What are you doing? Uh, second, second important aspect of the um, especially electrophysiological signals, movement is a bitch. <laughs> so every time that you have an ECG, an EDA or an EMG signal and then you move, like move your hand or like move your fingers or like scratch your fingers with everything, so you will see that the signal will change. The same thing will happen with ECG. So although it's kind of like complex always to control the movement of people when they are on their specific experiments, you certainly want to warn the participant to please avoid unnecessary movements, for instance, when they're interacting with a robot or uh, uh, something else. Kevin? Yeah, um, I was going to ask that, like the motion artifacts and GSR, um, because um, I think it's a bit restricting for the participant, like if you ask them, hey, don't move your hand, and then maybe they just can't consciously move your hand. Mm -hmm. But you will also mention that you can measure GSR like on body parts. Mm -hmm. Would that actually help with the motion artifact? To say if you somehow can place the electrode on the torso of the participant, since you're just measuring the conductance. Yeah. Um, Indeed, if you have. Um, uh, if your task, experimental work, is based on uh, a task that you need to do with hands, then recording EDA on the, uh, directly in the hands will be a mistake. Because then you will be you know, modifying the signal. So you probably will look for a different part of the body to reduce those motion artifacts. So that's always related to the tasks. Okay. Well, is it possible with the sensor that they have? Uh, yes, we will need to remove the straps and bring electrodes. So you place two electrodes over here. I think we have somewhere else, somewhere else dry electrodes. Then you place the electrodes and then you connect the sensor and then you strap it over here. So you just take the electrode on the, on the body? No, no, you, yeah, you place the electrode on the body and then you place the, the you see these heads, your electrodes. So you remove this one from the strap. And then you bring it, you put electrodes, and then you connect it directly. And, and to what would be the effect of this kind of movement? Uh, like torso, if I just am sitting like this and I'm sitting like this? Yeah, in the electrodermal activity, those type of movements are not necessarily affecting a lot of the signal. The problem is when you like move directly from the electrodes, from where the electrodes are connected. Okay. Those are like the, the, the main factors. So. You see, you see the signals. Let's record the signal. No. So you need to select here the sensor and then you come here to record. Mm -hmm. And then you can record directly into the SD or you can record into the computer. So based on the type of experiment you have, you want to record directly there or in the computer. So I'm going to record uh, to the computer and then boom, starts recording. So imagine this is the resting moment, so you will ask the participant to basically stay there, sit there, relax, don't talk, uh, remove the, the, the phone, put it in uh, um, airplane mode, um, be as comfortable as possible. Um, when uh, the person is leaving the, the hand, just right to not have metallic uh, surfaces or metallic objects around, because those can affect the conductivity, you normally clean, so we didn't do it here just because of the sake of time, but you normally clean the, the surface before placing the strap or the electrodes uh, and, um, and you just do a test of the signal right before starting. That's almost standard for all the signals that, that you have. And then um, 
this here has uh, is called event markers. So again, depending on the type of experiment you are doing, you can mark. So the moment that the robot was appearing, the, mo the, mo the moment where you using the wizard of Oz changed the behavior of the robot. So you will be able to put specific marks under the signal. So the moment of um, basically an analyzing the signal, you will be able to segment pieces, extract the features only for those pieces, which is uh, very much uh, advised. Could you just try to add events on this uh, on this plot right now? Try what? Add like the events, like a marker. Um, yeah, you have an, an even marker thing. Uh, um, that you need to create like. Uh, you know, you can create more markers, so you put the name where you want, but if, for instance, you have pulses and toggles here, you have pulse, and then, you see, this is a plot. So you know in, the, in, the, in this specific time, there was a pulse, or there was a, something that you just um, labeled, or a toggle. So you see, they come differently. So they're basically signals, so you identify the moment and you put the marker, and then you create your analysis based on those things. A researcher has to watch the participants and then, then uh, place these labels? That's based on the experimental design that you have, as yeah. I mentioned. So normally what I recommend is uh, just like two things that I try to always do. First, I have a scheme for markers. That means depending on what you are observing, you want to see if the behavior of the robot one specific behavior of the robot has a reaction on electrodon activity. But then you were running the same experiment for 20 minutes. So the first uh, experiment, the first behavior was five minutes, and then you switch it to the other five minutes. So you put you either put a marker if the experiment is not continuous, or you just record multiple EDI signals so you don't have to cover it when you are doing the analysis. So one behavior, one robot, you bring it, you are recording the lot I see and blah 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 boom. And then you finish, so you stop the recording, and then you bring the second robot, and then you start again a recording. That will basically um, speed up the analysis process because you don't need to separate those based on the timestamp. And those labels are on like a separate graph, and you will have to correlate those. Yes, you, we will see how the labels appear, but in a sense, you have columns. So they have zeros and ones based on the, 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 the type of uh, markers that you have. Steven? So if you have multiple shimmer devices, that recording will record for all of them? Yes. And then your markers is for also all of the mm -hmm. uh, signals? Yes, that's how it works. Uh, I think you, you were trying the Bluetooth with multiple devices, uh, Trevor. What was your experience? Yeah, like you could do that as well. How many was the, like, the maximum that you tried? I tried three at one point, they're fine. Mm -hmm. um, I think the main thing is like, I, this software probably does a lot more like sophisticated things for recording than what I was doing. Uh, so like I think doing something like recording would definitely recommend using your software and being able to add in markers and stuff. Um, so the component that I was working on, which we'll talk about on Friday, is more about interfacing with the uh, LSL protocol. So for doing live streaming to um, some sort of platform that can process them in real time. Yeah, the signals as they're appearing here, so they're just being recorded locally. So we are not actually streaming the data to be able to be used for robots or closed loop systems. Um, but yeah, you are the markers and uh, uh, you are everything, and then you will have the same timestamp for the markers and for the signals and for the multiple shimmer units, Alex. Yeah, another question, so, the, so all signals, all physiological signals are quite <clears throat> Temporal in the sense that you will end up reaching again this kind of equilibrium. It's not like I was thinking like you have two conditions of the row, one condition you do one behavior, the other one you do the second behavior. It's not that in one the GSR will be one fourth, the other one the, is going to be 80. You you can always, we always it will always go back to this kind of equilibrium, right? So you do an event, it will change, but eventually after four seconds, ten seconds, it will reach again an equilibrium, right? No, <laughs> that's, no. A, that's, actually, um, that's actually a good point of what uh, I wanted to show you uh, here. Because you show this graph of the two nervous systems, so you go up, I don't know what the systematic what was it? What what I, the, yeah, that's what I'm, uh, when I say like every signal is like a whole yeah, universe, is indeed, because each signal um, has very, very different uh, components and behaviors. Electrodermal activity, 
patterns. There are four um, kind of like type of patterns in which uh, people can be categorized based on their EDA responses. And here's what, I, uh, what I'm telling you, that you don't always come back to resting. So there's people that are called upwards. So basically, people that get stress. And are you stressed? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but she goes, she goes stressed. And then probably her EDA will just keep remaining. Stay there. So two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. The person is still, the heart is bumping, the, the sweat glands are still up. So it depends on the person's feeling. Depends on yeah, depends on the person and the context and, and everything. So one pattern is called upward. This is the second pattern. It's come downward. So it's the other way around. So the person is actually pretty high in terms of the stress and everything. So it got a uh, skin conductance response. So the moment that I scream to you, you got this one. And then you keep going uh, down. So it's basically when the person is super relaxed, chill, and he doesn't get along with a lot of the stressful things. So you will have downward relaxation assessment uh, profile. Uh, those are do upwards and downwards. <laughs> you will have this person. That is called the stair stepping. Is chronic yes, stress. people with chronic stress will probably elicit this type of behavior. So you have, you see, this all is mapped based on the their stimuli. So there's a stimulus one appearing, and then the person will stress. So you make an experiment with four different behaviors on the robot. So you get boom. The, the first behavior, the person is off. Then the second robot, so the person is already in a plateau and then it keeps going up because the skin uh, is, um, um, the skin conductance is reacting to it. And then suddenly you just get towards a point in which you saturate. Yeah, it's, the person is saturated and whatever response you're getting is not because the stimuli that you're providing just because the person is saturated. So you need to know those ranges in advance when uh, doing this type of experiments. And uh, this is the more uh, regular behavior that you will see. It's called uh, optimal skin conductance. So it's from a healthy perspective or point of view. We will see tomorrow uh, the Lara's behavior to see which of the profiles she is. Um, but, you know, she can be this one today. If you bring her in the afternoon after, I don't know, coffee or like a good Iranian food, she will, be, she will come over here. But you see, it's very, is, is very, there's a lot of uh, variance on it. But that's normally what you will see in a lot of people. Uh, you know, I've, I've made experiments with a lot of um, older adults and young adults. And, you know, unless they're like doing a lot of, uh, for instance, exercise, or they're drinking a lot of coffee, or the diet is strange, you will see people just getting here, there's a stimuli. The pig is, is, is called a galvanic skin response or skin conductance response, and then people will be back to this. Uh, resting state. And this is just EDA pattern, so I suppose it's happening. Right? For each of the signals that this we have, we, we, are, what the hell? <laughs> we <laughs> always have dif different patterns. And you know, that's the um, importance of picking and selecting well the type of signal that you will use for the technological state that you're trying to infer. Thank you, Rob. So, would you suggest, like, for example, before doing an experiment, we should have a um, before the experiment, we should use this these sensors here, for example, on that particular participant to get the profile before the study itself, or uh, it can be complicated because if we have a lot of participants, mm -hmm. but um, but as you said, that it can differ each day. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, through the day, not only each day, but through the day. Yeah, so even yeah. on the same day at, at different times. So, uh, yeah. so the question is, how do we? This is a confound. Because at the end, we want to say something with the data. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just had two cups of coffee. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that you cannot control, of course, by the reactions of people or like how, what you are. People can be scared about the roles and how, how do you control that level of scare if you want to see how engaged people are the roles. If they're initially scared, like that thing can be overlapping the rest of the physiological responses that you have. So that's why it's important to also have a good baseline recording. So based on recording, we always think that it's, oh, the person see the chill, resting, and no. Sometimes the baseline recording is, if you want to see the reaction of a person 
when there is a robot exposing a specific behavior in the resting baseline, you will just put the person right beside to the robot without doing anything. And that would probably be more accurate as a baseline than not having a robot at all. Because you are already in that baseline, you are already recording what is the person feeling when they have a robot that is just there. Not doing anything, but it's just there. Mm -hmm. Could you please link back the graphs? My plots. Mm -hmm. The ones? Yeah. The signals? Yeah. Do you want to describe it again? No. <laughs> Of this one, oh, sorry. Uh, you want to see it again? Yeah, please. Uh, so I don't move my hand, but whenever I just do like this motion, and I can see a decrease in in the plot. I cannot see it right now, but I say before. Yeah, but whenever I pinch, uh, I can look some decrease in the plot. I, in, I don't know why. Yeah, movements. <laughs> there's no uh, movement here. Or, I mean, when you're doing this, there's a level of pain or reaction yeah. or something that you are autonomically having. That means it's happening without the concept of your brain for it to happen, it's just autonomy. Mm -hmm. So that it, it changes the conductance of my that like, can screen. that can affect your arousal oh, yeah, and your yeah. conductance levels. Yeah, okay, it, 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 am I chill at the moment? I'm not. I'm not supposed to be chill. <laughs> you're not supposed to be chill. <laughs> well, it depends. Depends what is chill. That's why we will see probably tomorrow that on each signal you do something that is called normalization. So normalization is basically, you know, what are the the values that are supposed to be normal. And how do we take that entire signal and we normalize? In EDA, for instance, you do that in 0 to 100. So you get all the signal and you put it in numbers that are related to your skin conductance level, which is what you are getting when you're resting. So every time that you're going up or every time you're having a good gun skin response is because your arousal or conductivity is increasing and then you put that in terms of a percentage, for instance. That's normalizing. And for that, you need the data from the baseline of your skin conductance level. It's similar when you go and do exercise and heart rate. Uh, have you used the, the, those pads with the uh, feet, uh, with the activity trackers? You need the heart rate resting. Yeah. So they use the heart rate resting to like get a lot of the other things. It's very similar to this one. It's not like a normalization. Okay, what is your normal baseline resting state? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So I'm recording here. Is there a more stable signal than the EDA that has so many patterns? Do you have something that is more I will say this is one of the simplest. This is one of the simplest. One of the simplest <laughs> signals Which to, to work <laughs> to work with. Um, we will go through the feature instruction tomorrow, but I just wanted to show you that these are this is a table already that summarizes the main features. Uh, mostly in time. There's not a lot in, in frequency domain when it comes to electrodermal activity signals. Some signals, as we, as we will see, they have time domain and frequency domain components that are very relevant for the type of psychological state that we're describing. Some others where there hasn't been a lot of research and probably not a lot of the signals that are smooth, so they are like low pace, like the frequencies, they are not that uh, important a lot of the times. The ones that are changing a lot, EEG for instance, a lot of the the, the, the most interesting uh, features that you can extract from EEG and in frequency in the frequency domain. So you see this table is kind of like help, uh, helpful because it there's a uh, you know it gives you what are the, the definitions and the, the, the metrics. So you have skin conductance levels of the level that we have that's measured in microsiemens, it's conductance. So then you just get that number. 
changes in the skin conductance uh, level. So you, me you measure basically how much is that changing based on the resting. So uh, the, the frequency, how, how frequent are they happening? Uh, the, 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 the moment that the skin conductance response is, is happening and what is the amplitude, that step, the latency, rise time, and you know, there's plenty of uh, interesting um, values. Typical values, so we say typical, Unfortunately, um, the standards uh, in these type of signals are still going on. And even though these are the, what is supposed to be typical, you might find that with the shimmer devices, you will have crazy values of microsimmons. What is that? Because sometimes the manufacturers, they need to, uh, you need to apply extra formulas to bring them to what is supposed to be typical value. Same thing happened with IMU, so you are expecting those to give you uh, ranges of movement based on what is anatomically correct, but mm -mm. you need to take those and kind of like convert or transform them into something that is more interpretable. So there are some tables already with those, and these values are normally useful, but it's hard to find those for a specific population where you're looking. So if you have uh, young, uh, adults, uh, university students, North Americans. So it's hard to find a table where it's going to give you typical values for this because if you bring Chinese people, then they will have slightly different ranges of skin conductance people. Same thing for other people, different cultures or even genders. Uh, the second signal uh, is uh, ECG and heart rate variability. So thank you for this one. We can remove that. <laughs> So we'll try to, you know, just cover base, basic things for recording these three signals today. And tomorrow we will see more into the feature destruction section. So no worries if you are not getting what are the features that probably you would like to use with your sensors. It's just we are going now more towards the tools that we will be using for recording those. So ECG and hard availability, we will not go like deep links to ECG, like it's basically an electrophysiological recording of your heart uh, electrical activity. And, and on ECG is like widely used in the, in the medical community, but what a lot of people in physiological computing have been using mostly is heart rate variability. So how is your heart rate varying across the time and across experiences? So in a nutshell, <coughs> We are not interested on the rest of the elements of the complex. So we are not seeing the P, U, uh, P Q, S, T uh, peaks. You know, when you see the ECG, there's always P, Q, there are different peaks based on the, uh, um, the description of the wave itself. But we're only interested in hard variability on the maximum peaks, which are the R peaks. So in heart variability, what we do is basically we collect the ECG, then we see what is the differences between one peak and the other, the R peaks, then you have those differences are in, in uh, milliseconds, so 600 milliseconds, 700 milliseconds. And then you construct or you build a vector uh, with those based on the, those series. So you, 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 you build a series, a time series of each of the intervals differences. So at the end you have, you know, an RR, what's called the RR interval uh, vector, and with that one is, that one is like the, the main um, input for all your heart rate variability analysis. So that means that if you don't collect the ECG in a proper way, mm -hmm. then over here you probably will have you know, a signal that is not descriptive enough for your parameter. Why is this important? In the last decade, they have been uh, they um, they found that uh, indeed heart rate variability is a very good indication of resilience. When we talk about resilience here, is how well your body adapts to different stressors. So at the moment that I was screaming on on the lara, uh, so the heart rate probably was uh, going up, but at some point the heart rate you know was coming back to normality. So if you're able to come back to the normality, you are kind of like more resi resilient because you, your heart is reacting well. Probably some people would not be able to go over those type of situations. So heart rate variability is widely used when it comes to um, 
uh, try to quantify the cardiovascular performance of people under anxiety, of people under depression, or people when they are doing exercise. So they have a very good metrics to describe how well your uh, heart is actually bumping. So, so, the, the, so if, if your heart rate is high, right, so it, it increases, that means that you have more frequency in the peak, so the variability would be short, right? So it'd be smaller because it's less, less space between the peaks. Or how, how is That's kind of like the, the, um, the superficial okay. description of it. Yeah, it's, it's supposed like when you are, um, uh, if, for instance, doing exercise, like instead of having uh, the RP separated like this when you are resting, so they will somehow decrease. So the time series will, instead of being 700 milliseconds, then you will have 500 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, or those things. Um, but depending on the psychological state, uh, the heart rate will increase or decrease. Or indeed, what you are looking in heart availability is not specific increases or decreases, but mostly what is happening in between those two. When you bring the reaction, how was your heart before? And always after oh, the recovery after uh, the, the the stimuli is what you wanna what you wanna know, and that's why we need uh, uh, a time window that is not like four seconds or five seconds because your heart is not as fast as the uh, the sweat glands to produce uh, sweat. Your cardiovascular activity will, you know, need around twenty seconds to see the reaction of a specific stimuli based on the heart rate uh, variability parameters. So we have time domain and frequency domain. This is a good metric, see? The, the value makes it not change, you know? Like it's all at 2000, yeah. Oh, the, this one? Oh yeah, they change. They but change and they move a lot based on that. Actually, the, one of the first, or one of the most important uh, elements in pre-processing ECG for extracting RR intervals is peak detection. So those things you will see when you are chill, they are more or less always the same value. But the moment you start doing exercise, they will start moving around. It's called baseline wandering. Basically, the baseline is, is moving, it's wandering. But yeah, they normally change a lot and um, you need to uh, use some uh, filters and algorithms in order to extract those. Good thing though is this small thingy is giving you the RR intervals already, which is it saves you a lot of time because it's giving you already this time series so you can apply the, the algorithms to destroy the features. What about the optical one? It doesn't give you... So the optical only gives you the raw data. So you will okay. have... Yeah, whereas over here you have an ECG peaks in, the, in this one. So for the ECG you have like the, 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 the conventional peak. Are you seeing the marker? Oh, sorry. So, but for the PPG, so you will have this is this is like you see in PPE you will have something like this. So it's more like wavy. The R peaks over here are somehow you know equivalent to uh, uh, some peaks that you can detect in photoplexismography. But uh, you know there are differences because they are recording similar um, phenomenon, which is cardiovascular activity, but using different techniques. So the, the risk sensor gives PPG, not ECG. The risk one, yeah, gives you PPG. PPG. And yeah. PPG is different from ECG. Yes. They are not the same. They are not the same. One is electrophysiological, and it gives you all the peaks, and the other one is the saturation of the oxygen. The, at, the, at the end, you can transform that into heart rate, and then you can also do have a time series that is related to the uh, the peaks of the PPG, but you know they're slightly different. That's what I'm saying. That ECG is a little bit more accurate to it. So uh, we we have time domain and frequency domain in heart availability. Tomorrow we will see more into how to extract those. But just for you to see the, the you know how good heart availability can be to detect specific things. When we move, we have the time series, RR intervals. Then we extract, the, uh, with Fourier transform, fast Fourier transform, you extract the spectrum. Once you extract the spe spectrum, you can have a specific uh, ranges of the frequency. You say, okay, if it is 
from one hertz to three hertz, when it's from well, 0 0.2 to 0 0.6, they call it high frequency, low frequency, very low frequency, and those are components. If you extract the, 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 the total um, 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 contribution to, to those components, you will have a number. That number is basically related to the area under the curve of the uh, power spectral density uh, curve when you extract the Fourier transform. So those metrics are somehow related, and that's what makes hardware compatibility very used, to the two different branches of the autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetic. That means low frequency can be uh, low frequencies are related to the sympathetic, so more related to the activation. So they are in synchrony with what electrodermal activity is recording. Whereas, for instance, the high frequency and the very uh, the, the high frequency components and the very high frequency the high frequency components are more related to the parasympathetic. That means the restoration. So you have restoration when the person is. Uh, um, slowing down, then you also will see this component to increase based on the difference. So, and in a spectral analysis, you will have something like this. And when you see, like, these people already that have been putting friends, um, comparing a healthy subject, what is the component of the healthy subject versus what a manic bipolar patient will have in terms of, um, I think these are recordings for 24 hours. So you will be able to see specific profiles of people and how specific peaks are related to sleep quality or are related to manic events or anxiety uh, um, uh, or uh, any other uh, seizures that they might have when they are experiencing their episodes. So the frequency component of heart availability is uh, uh, still under research. There is a lot of ongoing research with this, but it's pretty good descriptor of many different psychological states. Mm -hmm. These are the features and the software that we have created for this. I'm just going to show it here to you. Yeah, volunteer. Speed. Through which? Through this? Yes. <laughs> so we have two of these. It's called a uh, polar chest strap. So um, what I was working with participants, so I instructed them on how to use the sensor um, so I didn't need to touch them so that was useful uh, because I was working with uh, uh, female older adults so I didn't want to touch their parts so in a sense what you do is um, you just bring it here, strap it first and then spin it around and you do that under the t-shirt and yeah check the right. And it does it like upside down as well. Uh, yeah, it needs to be this way. So polar needs to be upper like that. Mm -hmm. And there is an ID here that I will show you how to uh, bring it to the software tool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the software <laughs> is actually software that some of the students built um, some months ago. And um, this software is, uh, is uh, since the, um, a, the SDK of the Polar was Android, then uh, we build the... Where on the chest exactly? Just like you're going to leave the, like your sternum? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. it goes... I'm, I'm gonna, let me show you briefly here. It's on your stomach. Mm -hmm. Just on the very side? It's just the... the... Mm -hmm. Under the stem, but not on the stem. Okay. So this is the app. Okay. So, plastic, I can come here. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, I mean, it's always good when you, if you plan to use this sensor, it's always good that you actually show people, you know, where to put it. So, can you uh, bring the tissue up? Sure. So, what they normally recommend is putting this device right, um, uh, like the, the ribs. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a specific um, height of the ribs. But it's maybe if, if, there, if, there's a, if, if the person is a female, you ask them to put it under the breast. So uh, bring it up a bit. You will see that based on the position, the ECG will change. 
So if you put a little bit down, the armpits, which are the ones that you need to be super hit, uh, they're gonna be uh, the amplitude will vary, vary. So that means that when um, competing, the armpits you will have probably more difficult times, or the algorithm will have more difficult times. So we will see what works. So. Uh, this is the application. Oh, yeah, you can take a seat. So this is the application. It's, again, it's an Android application. Basically allows to connect to the device, uh, visualize the signals, record the data, and uh, 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 stream the data, which is what we will see on, uh, on Friday on how to use. So you get the device ID. Remember that uh, the ID is just over the... Um, Gonna have this. We have two different sizes. So for this, so this is basically a small model. This is a Bluetooth model. It comes with all the ECG thing, and this is um, uh, a conductive uh, yeah. strap, which allows you to, to get a signal. Sometimes it's good that you put some uh, water, or you can like moisturize the band, so the conductivity uh, goes better. But he was a little bit sweaty, so it, it helps. So yeah, check this kind of story. So this that's I think uh, an S uh, size. So what do we have? So we have the device ID, which is on the top of the sensor. So I check already that one, and you um, um, this runs only on Android, and we have like a phone and a tablet that are already with the with the signal. So. You see first the connection status, the, the sensor is connected, the battery level, and then it will immediately give you the heart rate. Remember, for getting the heart rate, you actually, if you are only collecting ECG, then you will need to process to get the heart rate, but, you know, again, the software gives you already the heart rate, and it's showing you the RR intervals. So every peak is making the difference, and then, you know, it's 700. So, we uh, uh, would be actually able to see the, um, the ECG. So, if you take a closer look here, this sensor has also an, an accelerometer, so you also can record the movement to, uh, to the right to the left. And This is the heart rate and the RR intervals. So you will see the heart rate is going, heart rate is direct. So it's around 80, 90 BPMs. So what you're expecting people on resting will be like 80, 90, 70, 70 to 80 something. And the other one are the RR intervals, which is supposed to be here the X with the numbers, but it's like 700, 800, 900 uh, milliseconds. And this is the ECG plot. So important things if you are using this sensor. So I know you notice here that the, the R peak um, probably is not that um, uh, the amplitude of the R peak is not necessarily super high. So then that can mean that probably the sensor will require to bring it, put it a little bit up. So see if you try try to bring it a little bit up. Yeah, you can kind of like take it and then you yeah keep bringing it up. You see, like when you move in, when you're moving the, se the sensor, like that creates all the the mess. So, what you basically want, at least for the type of analysis we do, is to get this peak as different as possible from the rest of the metrics that we are getting into the other. So how, how do we see that it is placed at the right position and from the graph? Yeah, what was wrong before? Huh? Was oh, the R peak, the amplitude was a little bit lower. So you always try to move it around in a way that the R peak is as kind of different as possible from the rest. That means the amplitude is certainly um, above the, the rest. Um, it's hard sometimes to actually move the sensor towards getting like a, a good RP. Again, 
they have their own algorithms to um, get the heart rate and RR intervals. But what I've noticed from this specific device is as clean as you have the RP, the better the, C, the time series will be. And we will show tomorrow some artifacts related to this one. But in a sense, what you want to do is to move around the sensor in a way that the, 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 the peaks are uh, dif differential enough. Can you uh, move? Stand up. Yeah, stand up and do some. Uh, yeah. Increase the heart rate, man. Yeah. I don't want to like, move too much. Yeah, but this, 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 I mean, this sensor is meant for army. So, yeah, the but one, of the good, one of the good things of this sensor, once compared to, for instance, the ECG you will get, you, you can keep going, stay strong. Okay. <laughs> so, one of, the, one of the important things of this sensor is exactly what we're looking right now. So, this sensor is specifically made for exercise. That means that the algorithms that they have have been optimized for that. If you get the ECG from the shimmer device, you will get a signal that is hell, it's a mess. It's very hard to process that one. So that's why this sensor is certainly uh, being widely used. So you see now, the heart rate is increasing, whereas the RR intervals are decreasing. So because the ECG now is shrink shrinking. So, so. it means that, that your, your heart is pumping more blood and that's why so meaning that if you are in relaxed state, your RR should uh, yeah. increase. Yes, they can go like up to uh, 900 milliseconds or 900 and something, and you know that's RR intervals can be itself like an interesting way to uh, talk about relaxation when people are getting relaxed. If they're breathing pretty well, yeah. But again, this is a very simple metric. It's like heart rate, yeah. so that's why they extend it to heart rate, heart rate variability. So how do you record this? Last thing is re would be recording. So imagine um, so you get, uh, start um, start recording. You hit the start recording button. We have again the H10 and the optical heart rate sensor. The difference is with the optical sensor you wouldn't be able to get the heart rate or the RR interval, so you will need to do it yourself. It's not necessarily very complex, but uh, I mean, it requires extra work for you to strike the peaks and do well, some other processing that I will show you tomorrow. So we're recording some data, and then at some point we just stop recording and, and hit on export data. When you hit on export data, it will prompt you uh, this, and then you will basically send the data from this tablet to uh, uh, your email. You will need to put that into the ethics, like all the data is flowing and uh, what is the type of uh, emails that you're using. You probably will need to use the URL email to do those, those things. So, um, again, um, you can ask people to do uh, to the connectivity themselves. Try to put some water to facilitate the conductivity. Once removed, you also clean it with some extra alcohol. Uh, there is a battery. Always check the status of the battery so you don't want the battery to run <laughs> out in the middle of the experiment. Uh, normally, the battery lasts a lot, so probably for the following year, you are not going to have troubles with it. And uh, if you want to use hard variability, I recommend you to use a chest strap rather than the other. The optical sensor. Uh, excuse me. So for analyzing stress and anxiety, um, the it is more accurate than the other skin response, right? The ECG. <clears throat> um, I will say they're good when you combine both. Mm -hmm. Like is like that combination is actually good for stress and anxiety, and anxiety. But I mean, the literature is again not conclusive. So there's some people that have been working a lot in the stress and anxiety with only or purely heart rate variability and purely EDA and depending on the context sometimes, depending on the, the, the type of uh, the sample size of the people or the, um, uh, yeah, the demography, the, the, the demographics. So it would be one signal better than the other. But if you are tackling that, um, I can send you, I mean, some of the readings that we have, there's actually a table that shows what are the, 
the best features for specific psychological states, including stress and anxiety. Yeah, that's so there is, there is a mapping between physiological data and psychological states. 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 Mm -hmm. That you can map on yourself. Yeah. yeah. For this one, you need this, this, this. Yeah. It's actually the, the suggested um, reading. I can show you. It has one table, and that table is pretty useful for showing you those uh, specific metrics. So um, after, uh, before that, you can uh, stop the connection. And it also has an uh, accelerometer, so you can also record movement with the same thing. And at the end, I'm going to show you, you can now remove it. Leave it there, I'm going to clean it later today. Mm -hmm. have all the official half of the <laughs> yeah, the, we needed to uh, develop our own app because we wanted to stream the data. The official data that they have is good for recording the data and keeping the data for yourself. But um, also in terms of ethics, so they don't like when you use uh, manufacturer's applications for those things because you don't know where the data is going. So we also developed our own app. And, you know, based on, on all of these problems. Um, Power availability, uh, features, uh, time domain, and frequency domain. So we will see them tomorrow. But in a sense, those are statistical descriptions. So you get all the time series, our, our intervals, and then you say, okay, what is the standard deviation? Boom. It's called SD, standard deviation of NN. And NN are basically normal intervals. So they say, between this one and between this one, what is the interval? And that the time series instead of some people, some people call it RR, but uh, in literature you will find NN, which is the N intervals. So you got standard deviation, the uh, root mean square standard deviation of all the time series, and there's plenty of other metrics in uh, in uh, time domain. Time domain kind of like uh, combines a little bit of both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Frequency is better in the in differentiating between uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And I think we are out, so we probably will uh, start tomorrow with the uh, inertia measurement units because two hours already. Um, but um, in a sense, that's just, that's what it, I wanted to show you today: EDA and uh, heart rate variability. Uh, these are some of the software tools that we have. I'm going to share with you the slides so you take a closer look. Um, there's always references here, if you want to learn more about each individual signal, there's always uh, reading for it. Uh, and yeah, questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.